Hello everyone, today we'll be talking about adenoid cystic carcinoma. So adenoid cystic carcinoma, it's a slow growing and relentless salivary gland malignancy composed of epithelial and myoepithelial neoplastic cells that form various patches including tubular, cribriform and solid form. So it's a slow growing and relentless salivary gland malignancy. So you need to read some salivary gland malignancy and it is slow growing. And what is it composed of? It's composed of epithelial and myoepithelial neoplastic cells. And then another thing that I've mentioned is it forms various patterns. So what are the patterns? These tubular, cribriform and solid forms. So what is adenoid cystic carcinoma? So it's an uncommon form of malignant neoplasm that arises within secretory glands, most commonly the major and minor salivary glands of the head and neck. Other sites of origin include the trachea, lacrimal gland, breast, skin, and vulva. This neoplasm is defined by its distinctive histologic appearance. Remember the appearances we talked about? Tubular, cribriform, and solid forms, okay? This is a diagram that changes the adenoid cystic carcinoma in the head palate. So epidemiology, the female to male ratio is about 1.5 to 1. There is no ethnic predilection. A wide age range has been reported for adenoid cystic carcinoma. It includes cases in the pediatric age group. Most individuals are diagnosed with the disease in the fourth through six decades of life. If you see a count for less than 1% of all head and neck cancers and less than 10% of all salivary gland neoplasms, there is no strong genetic or environmental risk factors have been identified. Various studies have shown chromosomal abnormalities and genetic deletions occurring in samples of ECC. There is some evidence that the P53TSG is inactivated in advanced and aggressive forms of this neoplasm. So basically, there is no strong genetic or environmental risk factors, okay? However, there is some evidence that P53 tumor suppressor gene is inactivated in advanced and aggressive forms of this neoplasm. Localization. So it occurs most frequently in the sal major salivary glands, but more than one third of cases occur in the minor, minor gland in the oral cavity and rarely in the other sites, okay? So when we talk about major salivary glands, we're referring to the parotid, submandibular, and sublingual glands. When we talk about the minor glands in the oral cavity, we're referring to the labial gland, buccal gland, glossopalatine gland, and palatine and lingual gland, okay? Then when we say other sites, we're referring to the trachea, the lacrimal gland, breast, skin, and vulva, okay? Signs and symptoms. So signs and symptoms depend largely on the site of origin of the tumor. Early lesions of the salivary glands present painless masses of the mouth or face, usually growing slowly. Advanced tumors may present with pain and or nerve paralysis. And nerve paralysis mostly commonly presents with numbness, okay? For this neoplasm has a propensity to invert peripheral nerves. So Adenoid cystic carcinoma is able to invade peripheral nerves. Tumors of the lacrimal gland may present as proptosis and changes in vision. ACC arising in the tracheobronchial tree may present with respiratory symptoms while tumors arising in the larynx may lead to changes in speech. So clinical features that we talked about are basically swelling or masses, may have numbness, paresthesia or pain. Then involvement of motor nerves can cause facial or tongue weakness. Then most adenoid cystic carcinomas are widely infiltrative at diagnosis. They invade bone early and characteristically show perineural infiltration. Clinical cause due to its indolent cause ACC. Sorry. So one thing you need to know is that. Due to its slow growth, ACC has a relatively indolent but relentless course. So when we say indolent, meaning it progresses very slowly. 
but relentless. So basically, it is still going to progress, but slowly, okay? So unlike most carcinomas, most patients with ACC survive for five years, only to have tumors recur and progress. Another unusual feature of ACC is that, unlike most carcinomas, it seldom metastasizes to regional lymph nodes. Distance metastasis is the most common presentation of treatment failure. So if you notice this distance metastasis, most likely those treatment failure. And the lung is by far the most common site of metastasis with the liver being the second most common site. Bone metastasis usually indicate a fulminant cl clinical course. Poor prognostic signs at the time of initial surgery are a solid growth pattern, perineural invasion of major nerves and a positive margins after histopathologic examination. So to our poor prognostic signs, so solid growth pattern, remember we had three? Yeah, so if we have the solid growth pattern, that's a poor prognostic factor. Then perineural invasion of major nerves and a positive margins after histopathologic examination. So histopathology, so this is a series of three histologic patterns have been shown that are to be of prognostic value. So the cribriform pattern, this is the most recognizable architectural form. It's characterized by nests of tumor cells interrupted by sharply punched out spaces filled with basophilic material. That's what we're talking about. Then the tubular pattern. It's composed of bilayer tubules with lumina. The tumor cells show scan cytoplasm and typically have small angulated and hyperchromatic nuclei. Then the solid growth pattern. This is characterized by sheets of tumor cells without lumen formation. A may consist of epithelial or myoepithelial elements. This is what we're talking about. So diagnosis. Diagnosis is made by histologic analysis of a biopsy or resection specimen of a tumor mass. There are three major variants, variant histologic growth patterns of ACC, which we already talked about, cribriform, tubular, and solid. And we always say the solid pattern has poor prognosis, right? So it's associated with a more aggressive disease course. There are no serum markers for this neoplasm. And recurrences are usually identified by radiographic imaging techniques, such as computed tonography, which we commonly call the CT scan. So grading, so this depends on a simple analysis of the morphologic pattern of the tumor. So if, if it's tubular, that's low grade. If it's cribriform, that's intermediate grade. And if it's solid, that's high grade. But then some high grade tumors also show de-differentiation, which is they're basically very poorly differentiated. So in your know, histochemical adenoid cystic carcinoma expresses both ductile and myoepithelium cell markers, such as CK7, CAM5.2 calponin, SMA, SMMHC, 6B3, CD117, SOX10, and S100. The one that we commonly refer to is the MYB and NY, MYB and FIB. Genetic profile. So the ACC specific translocation, which is 6 to 9 chromosomal translocation, resulting in a MYB and FIB gene fusion. So in addition, over 80% of adenoid cystic carcinomas show a translocation involving the MYB oncogene and the transcription factor gene and FIB. Perineural invasion is a feature of most ECCs. Even anatomical barriers can be bridged since all are pierced by neurovascular bundles. Clinical evidence of nerve invasion is a poor prognostic indicator and evidence may manifest as paralysis, paresthesia, deafness, diplopia, pain, or tick sensation. So standard therapy is surgical resection whenever possible is the mainstay. Then a few specialized centers offer neutral beam therapy. Then investigational therapy, we have got some clinical trials that examine the effect of new chemotherapeutic drugs such as paclitaxel and gencitabine. However, currently the main treatment is surgical resection. So differential diagnosis consists of in the salivary glands include benign mixed tumor, epidermoid C and polymorphous low-grade adenocarcinoma. So basically that's all about our ACC, adenocystoid carcinoma.